All right, we still got a few seats up front if anybody needs it. And otherwise, we just kind of got is there, is that all open. Got four seats right here up in the second row, Brother Ray, if we need that. We'll squeeze together a little bit here. I'm going to ask Brother Isaac Drake to come now, and he's in Billings, Montana. Brother Drake, why don't you come at this time, please? <clears throat> Yeah, maybe a little higher. All right, good uh, afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. I had to look at the time because I slept yeah. in quite a bit this morning. It's, it's okay at the other Brother Havman meetings. I hope it's okay at this meeting to sleep in as a preacher. I've been flying across the country and staying up till three in the morning talking to the brethren. I don't do that anymore, but I had a good conversation with Brother John the other night, and that was a blessing, and I got to catch up this morning. So I, I still feel like it's eight or nine o'clock here. I'm just getting going. If you would, turn to, uh, let's try First Samuel 15. First Samuel 15. This is my first meeting, and most of the people that I know closely or know well, it's their first time to this meeting too. So I don't know how we all landed on this decision. We booked a booked a place and then somebody else said they were coming and wanted a room and somebody else wanted a room and they had to get another place and and uh, so we all got we all got settled in and good to see a bunch of familiar faces here, a bunch of new faces too. So um, you know how you say something and then uh, as it's coming out of your mouth, you think, I wonder uh, if I should have said that. <laughs> and I've said before, and maybe some of you heard me say this, when I come to a preacher's meeting, I shuffle through and get the best messages out of my, out of my file, and I, I, I you know, pray about which ones to preach and which one to have on top and to have ready to go. And uh, so I did that, because I always do that. And then as I was getting out of the car here, I looked at the stack, and they're all in this jumbled mess that I need to go through. And I said, I'll go through those tonight uh, if he has me preach tomorrow. I'm just going to leave those here for now. And I, my Bible flipped open to the very front, and I had a message in there from yesterday. And I felt like the Lord said, that's the one. So this is the one. And this isn't what I would have picked, and this isn't my best message of the year. Um, and my, maybe you'll agree with me when we're done. First... <laughs> 1 Samuel 15. I just have one verse here, and this is the life of Saul, but I'm not going to preach on the life of Saul, but I just wanted to use it for a, a springboard uh, a text, whatever you call that. But 1 Samuel 15, let's read the, the verse here. It says in verse 24, it says, And Samuel said unto Saul, 1 Samuel 15, 24, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Lord, I ask that you would uh, please bless this message. Uh, like the brother said, um, it's, just, uh, it's just notes on a page. It's just an outline. It's just um, the best we could, we could throw together in our efforts. And Lord, uh, if you get in it, and if you would please uh, speak to people through it, then we'd consider it a successful thing. We'd consider it uh, good success in your eyes, God. And Lord, I ask you please bless what I'm about to say here. Help me to say it and say what's needful and what would be helpful to these people that have come here today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this, is, this is more of a, a topical message, and I want to talk about the title of this message is What Happens When a Christian Sins? What Happens When a Christian Sins? Uh, turn to Ephesians 4. Turn to the verse that you all have memorized and just look at it with me. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 30, uh, number 1, when a Christian sins, he grieves the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 and verse 30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know, have you ever considered that uh, the people that think they could lose their salvation, if that was the case... If the Holy Spirit just left you every time you sinned, how would you grieve him? 
He'd just leave. He wouldn't be there. He wouldn't be present with you. If you're, if you're saved, you're saved. And you say, well, you don't have to say that to this group of people. I'm surprised at who uh, doesn't, doesn't mind it that the Holy Spirit is sealed inside of you. We could all go down the list of proof texts and our doctrine, and we know to, that James and Matthew don't support it. We all know why, and we could all preach and teach on that. But for the Christian who has the Holy Spirit sealed inside of them, it is a grief to the Holy Spirit when you sin. You say, why don't you sin, Isaac? One reason that I don't sin is I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. And, um, I, I mean, what... You live in this world, Jesus had to wash the disciples' feet, amen, and your feet get dirty. But you don't have to go walk through the sewer pit along the side of the road, right? You don't have to go out of your way to get dirty. We understand you get dirty, and that's not an excuse to sin. I had a man come to me one time, and I, there was one thing that I'd been preaching on and just mentioning, and I didn't know if he was, he was hearing me or if it was getting through or not. And one day I just said it to him directly. After a couple of months, I'd maybe said something one or two or three times. And after a couple of months, I said to him directly, hey, brother, this thing is wrong in your home or family. And this thing is, this thing is not right. And he said, Isaac, we're all sinners. And I think if I had to put it on like, where our relationship deteriorated, that was the point. That was the turning point of where everything deteriorated, went downhill, and we don't, we don't, we're not in contact anymore. Um, it's, not, it's not okay for you to justify your sin because we all do it. Right. And, right. and right. another brother does it, and this is what his stand. And you're looking to see who does what to see what's okay for you to do. Um, I mean, it, it, 50 years ago, I would be, uh, or even 20 years ago, I would be preaching against the television, right? But who watches TV anymore? You got it condensed down to this little personal screen, right? It's just for you. And I come into my kid's bedroom, and they're all huddled up on the bed, and they got the iPad hooked up, and they're watching, you know. But you know what I have to do with my kids? I have to get them to the point that they understand that they're accountable to God. I can't look at every little screen that they're looking at all day long, and I'm not, and I'm not going to try. I'm going to correct it when I come across it, and my parents did that with me, and I hope they did that with you. But you have to come to the point where your kids have to come to the point where they see their relationship between them and God the way you see it between them and God. And the authority has to trans, transfer over to God. Now, how exactly to do that and how precisely to do it, maybe somebody else could teach a counseling session on that. But uh, I think the best way to do it is for you to follow God and your kids will follow your example. Don't you see God's correction um, in you the same way that you see your correction in your children? See, so how do you discipline your kids, Isaac? I spend a lot of time thinking about how God disciplines me. God doesn't follow me every, I mean, he sees everything I do, right? But God isn't there ready to smack me off of the path and knock me down and humiliate me every time I make a misstep. And the regimented, rigid, structured control is good for some people in some group for some times. I don't think that's good for everybody. You say, well, what about like a roll-off home ministry? I think they needed that. I think they needed you sit down, you don't look up, you don't look, you read your Bible, you memorize these verses, right? I don't know if my six-year-old needs that. <laughs> because my six-year-old's not, you know, living that, living that life, that... Uh, that wicked worldly experience and those things from their, their parents. So Isaiah 59. I have to apologize to the one family that came with me this time. They're going to have to get a repeat. So maybe you guys need a double. I don't know. Um, I am Brother Congrove got up here, and he said, it sure is a blessing to be able to go out and do some evangelism and uh, have more than that one guy that goes with me. And my wife leaned over. She's like, or it's nice to just have that one guy. <laughs> I've been going out on that street corner at 24th and King for a number of years now, and it's nice to have that one guy. Amen. <laughs> right. Isaiah 59. I'm not trying to knock, Brother Congro. I think you get it. Isaiah 59, uh, verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, 
neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you that he will not hear. Maybe that's not earth shattering for you this, this afternoon, but uh, that's a verse you ought to have memorized. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. There's going to come a time in your life where you need God to listen to you. There's going to come a time in your life where something didn't go the way you planned it, and things got way out of whack, and you couldn't see it coming, and if you had seen it coming, you would have prepared for it, and you would have been braced for it, and uh, like Brother DeMichael said one time, you would have picked the situation that you could have looked spiritual in. (laughs) And I could have looked like I was suffering, and I could have handled that, but that's not the one that God dishes out on your plate. And in that time, that's the time when you're going to need to know, I can go to that third row in in my front row of my church building, or wherever it is that you pray, and I can sit there, and I can get a hold of God, and God will hear me. You know why, uh, what, what happens when a Christian sins, their prayers are hindered. The Bible says, uh, confess your sins, Right? If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Now, I'm going to give you something practical that might not be doctrinally true, so you guys can all hash it out over lunch or dinner. <laughs> but uh, this is what helps me, and this is what I do, and if it's wrong, I'm sure somebody will correct me. But uh, I love this crowd because of that. <laughs> but I was just prefacing um, what I'm going to say. Um, I wouldn't ask you to raise your hands, but I mean, how many of you do not raise your hands? How many of you have gone weeks or maybe months or maybe longer than that without confessing your sins? And that verse says, your sins have separated between you and your God. And the verse says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, here's the question. Here's the thing that I had taught when I was, when I was younger. I heard somebody say, I sat down and filled up eight pages front and back of single space lines of all the sins that I hadn't confessed in so much time, and I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> is, that what, is that what we're supposed to do? <laughs> I, would, I would need more notebooks than I could afford at some points and times in my life. And I've gone down in prayer, in, on my knees in prayer and said, Lord, um, I cannot remember those things that I have sinned against you in this amount of time. And I'll admit, if you don't admit or not raise your hand, but um, there have been times in my life where it's been weeks and months. And you say, well, if I'm going to pray, then I have to confess my sins, right? If I'm going to confess my sins, then I can't, so then I can't pray. So if I can't pray, then why would I get down and confess my sins? You say, well, I don't have these logic problems. I do have these logic problems. (laughs) You say, it's much simpler for me. I hope it is. But maybe some of you who overthink everything and overanalyze things like myself, maybe that could be a help to you that it said, if we confess our sins, I can get down on my knees with a clear conscience and say, God, I have forgotten so many things that I could never remember that I have sinned against you. Would you please put those things under the blood? Lord, if you bring something to my mind right now, can, can you bring it to my mind so I can confess it? And things will trickle into your mind, and you can, that's, that's how I do it. Now, that's a help to you. I hope it's a help to you. But here's the thing. Don't delay on your prayer because your sins have separated between you and your God. When a Christian sins, his prayers are hindered, but we have an answer. And the answer is humility. You know the answer. You have one instruction to your church the church of Laodicea. You say, I'm a Philadelphian in the Laodicea period. Congratulations for you. I hope that we can all achieve to that someday. Our church age was given one instruction at the end of that whole thing. It was given some, some, some in between. There's preaching on that. But the final instruction was two words. Be zealous and repent. And repent. Get on fire. Get your metabolism up. I like that. That's what makes the metabolism work. Isaac, you just eat all day long. Yeah, and I also carry 50 pounds of tools with me all day long. Every time I see you, you're eating. I know, and I burn thousands of calories a day. And then he explained it. It's your metabolism. How do you keep that up? You keep a fire burning in there. You know how that fire is kept up? The stuff that I've read, the little that I understand about health, it's kept one way is by eating, and the other way is by working. And I'm not a health expert, but that's the zeal. 
That's the fervency. That's the fire. And then the other thing that you're instructed to, that means these are the things we have a problem with that naturally we're going to walk into. Zealous, zeal, and not enough zeal, and then humility, repentance. You live in a culture that's full of pride, and pride is okay and expected of you. I've had employees work for me, and because I did not act like a proud, cocky so-and-so to them and get over their face and yell and scream at them, they had no respect for me. And I said, no, I asked you to do this, and my words mean something. This is how I operate. I operate as if words have meaning to them. It's not understood in our culture by a lot of people. That's a, that's a trait. That's a problem. Look at, look at 1 Peter 3 on your prayers being hindered. Verse Peter 3, and um, all of us preachers like verse 1, because the third word is ye wives. I have, it, I have it highlighted in blue in my Bible. And I noticed that the next six verses discuss that address there. They address that group. And then I also have highlighted in blue verse 7, likewise ye husbands. Ye husbands. And the husbands, we only get one verse. So... I guess the women need six times more preaching than, than the husbands need, according to a King James Bible. Because in verse 8, their instruction is ended, and it says, Finally, be ye all of one mind. So now we're back to everybody. And it's easy to preach to the wives, because we're all men preaching here. But look at verse 7. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. You're smarter than your wife. Hmm? You have a better IQ than your wife. Good. Men are better at everything than women. <laughs> you, you believe that? Okay, husbands, if you have that amount of knowledge, then surely you should be able to dwell with them according to the amount of knowledge they have and deal with them on that level. Surely. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor... Unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. My wife and I, we work together very directly. I like to be very specific and very clear, and I like to know what she's thinking. And if we're upset at each other, it doesn't go into week-long silence treatments. Right. It doesn't, doesn't happen in our home. When we were younger and first married. It might have lasted two days, and I don't remember if anything stands out more than that. Um, but the, the attitude we lived by was let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And when you go in the bedroom and the door's closed, the business is out there, the church stuff is out there, and it's time to have fellowship with my wife without all the other things. And if uh, two people are facing opposite sides in the bed and just uh, given the silent treatment, and um, that's not a, a husband giving honor unto his wife. My wife actually came to me with that one day. I said, what is the thing? What is the thing that I'm doing wrong? Show me in the Bible. You know, I've been married two years. I got it all figured out. You show me from the Bible what I'm doing wrong, and I'll listen. And she said, do you honor me? You ever been preached at from a dictionary before? <laughs> And I went to the Lord, and usually he takes my side on those things. <laughs> he didn't take my side that time. She's deserving of honor. Men are better at everything. I had a guy in my church yesterday. He said, he said except cooking. And, and I'd have to agree in my home that's the case, but uh, the best chefs are men. They don't put Olympic athletes up against each other, men competing against women from different countries. That, that doesn't, doesn't make sense. You know that. And if, that's, if I can't say that, then just get, you're the one that's got too much screen time, okay? Um, but you know why you're to honor her? She can do one thing that you can't do at all. She can produce life. And she can nurture that life, and she can raise that life while you're not there and guide the home. That's worth some honor. 
How many of you ever been in court and stood up for the judge when he walked in the room? You stood up because you were in court. Boy, those kind of things, they, uh, why do I, why am I pledging for the flag, right? Biblically, why am I doing that? I got I to gotta think about those things. I mean, this, is this my flag? Is this my country? Okay, I can, I told you, I got to rationalize things. I stand, sit in a court and the judge comes in, they say, all rise, and I say, why am I standing for this lost man? Right? This is probably a liberal. Probably I could look him up and find out what he or she all believe. Why am I standing for them? And then I find the verse one day in the Psalms. I believe it's in the Psalms. It says that you rise before the white, the hoary head. The, you rise before that and you give honor unto somebody yeah. who's older than you in that capacity. They have arrived into the point of deserving honor from you. Amen. Why does your wife deserve honor? Because she can do things that you can't do as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together, heirs together of the grace of life. Heirs is an inheritance. And I don't know how to preach this. I preached it both ways. That maybe your inheritance together in heaven is connected at the judgment. And that may be that you are heirs together, your inheritance of the things in this world in Life are connected together until you die, until death do you part. You're heirs together of the grace of life. Now here's the point of the the, the point. That your prayers be not hindered. Now of all the things to check off on the list and see what's happening in your prayers and why things don't get through for you, sin is the first one. But if you're married... I mean, have you ever taken note of the things that you and your wife prayed together for and looked at what came to pass and then looked at the things that you prayed for by yourself and what, came, what the Lord did? I, I, I mean, when you pray and then your wife prays and you're praying for the same thing, I don't know if it's like extra bonus points in, the, in heaven when the angels are writing it down. I don't know how, but it says that it carries more weight if you read everything included in that text and put it all together. You're, you're working together toward the same thing of this grace of life. Yeah. Like you don't just have life, but you have life more abundantly in Jesus Christ. You have something the world doesn't have in a marriage. Whatever they have, you know, or what do you think about gay marriage? I don't think anything of it. They're not even married to begin with. They're just a bunch of dogs, right, in the world. Sheep, we're sheep, they're dogs and pigs, and they're, they're just doing their own evolutionary thing. And, and God doesn't even recognize that stuff spiritually, okay? It's the laws of the land. Just you know what I'm saying. Verse seven for a Christian that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, verse eight: Be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. How much time do I have, brother? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep on running through these. I don't have time to get through them all. What happens when a Christian sins? Turn to Philippians one. Philippians one. Philippians 1 and verse 3, it says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Paul, remember in the church at Philippi. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy, for your fellowship is in the gospel from this day until now. Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I went to a conference recently, and in that conference they said, work on your strengths, find somebody else to take care of your weaknesses. Say, why are you pausing so long? Because I want you to think about that. Is that true or is that not true? I've heard preachers say, work on your weaknesses. Successful men of this business world say, work on your strengths. Let somebody, hire somebody else to take care of your deficiencies. And in less than 20 minutes, in a Bible-believing church, in a conference, I got the answer to that from Brother Kevin Congrove, have Jesus Christ help you with your deficiencies. I don't, I've never been to one of these type of conferences. It was like how to 
make your business do better and ideas for it, and then they can't help but have their preachers come in and their motivational speakers. And I said to myself when I decided to go to this and, and invest a little time into going to this, see what it's what it could help me or, or what it could do for me, I said, I'm going to contrast that thing with this meeting this week. It didn't take 20 minutes to see the contrast. You know what God's trying to do in you? He's trying to do a work that he wired you to do. He's trying to perform a work through you so that it can accomplish something to his glory and redound to him. A rebound in basketball is where you get back the same thing. A redounding in in scriptural things and spiritual things is God gives you something to work with and you give something different back to him and it glorifies him with what he's given you to work with. You know how you have that confidence? The thing that God began in you is the thing that he wants to complete in you. You know how you have the confidence after four and a half years of being in uh, a city in this country and trying to start a church and saying, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because... I'm confident of one thing. Do you know why the men who come from other places and try to start a work and get discouraged after a year and two years don't finish the thing? It has to do with their confidence, and it's connected with what the work Jesus Christ is doing in you. I stood behind a pulpit at another brother's and I said, um, I love the verse about Jesus Christ said, this is Peter, but upon this rock, I will build my church. And every once in a while as a preacher, I stand here and say words and they get imprinted in stone in my mind. Like, you're going to remember saying that. (laughs) And you may regret it, but you will not forget saying that phrase, I will build my church. And I decided that I'm not going to build my own church, that Jesus Christ will build my church. And that's what gives me confidence. I had a strange thing happen a couple months ago. I don't even know what to think of it. A guy came in, he was kind of Kind of seemed a little Pentecostal to me. I found out later he wasn't. He's a saved guy. But um, definitely not not my stripe, not my beliefs. And uh, he said, I I felt the Lord pressing on me all day to come here. He said, I drove by, I saw there was cars. I drove by, I saw there was cars. And I drove by again for your third service, saw there was cars there. And then uh, I drove by again, saw there's nobody here. And it looked like there was still lights on. So, So now I'm here. And I said, okay, well, I, I think we saw you in the parking lot because not a whole lot of cars drive through here, and we were excited there might have been a visitor today. <laughs> Thanks. He's like, well, I just wanted to tell you I'm coming here with boldness. After driving by three times and not coming in, I'm coming here with boldness <laughs> to tell you that the Lord wanted me to be an encouragement to you, and something's going to happen in the next something, something months. You see, that's cheesy. I thought it was cheesy, too. In some strange way, it encouraged me. <laughs> <laughs> And I took it as from the Lord. And he didn't say everything doctrinally right. And he, you know, we had a a good discussion for a while. But I took it as from the Lord that I never stay after church and sit down. I always leave. That's the only time I ever had before or since. Stayed there and said, I'm going to go through my books and make note cards. I don't know why I'm doing this. And I sat down and then this guy came in and told me that. And I said, Lord, I'm going to take that as from you, as silly as it seemed. And that was an encouragement to me. And then... Within the last six months, everybody's asking, how you doing? How's your church doing? And usually I avoid you, and I don't respond to your texts when you ask me that. And um, just publicly, I give the credit to the Lord that in the last six months, the Lord's been blessing it as far as people showing up, people being faithful, people being interested, asking questions about things that actually are important in their life, and, and people being helped. You know, when a Christian sins, it stops his work in you. Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It prevents God from rewarding you. It shows contempt for God's words. It makes future tr- trouble absolutely certain when a Christian sins. There was a man, um, uh, Pastor Criswell, over in uh, Texas, and he called a preacher, Powell, over in Nashville, and he said, Pastor Powell, I want you to send one of your best guys over here. And in the men, that your men are um, are good preachers, and you have some good men over there. You pick the guy, you send him to our church, and we're gonna have a service this week. And I wanna I wanna tell I wanna have him come in for this special meeting. 
So Brother Powell, the Pastor Powell, sent a man named John Clifford. And uh, Bobby Criswell, I believe that's his name, tells the story. And he says it was a great meeting. He said they had people saved. They had people down at the altar every night. The whole week was, it was just a fantastic meeting. And John Clifford, he went home there that week. And he, um, he, went, back to, he went back to his church. And they, they didn't see him again. And five years later, Bobby Criswell was standing outside of the church. He walked out there and saw a man leaning against the corner of his building. And he said, hey, are you here for the church service this afternoon? And he said, don't you recognize me? He said, no, I don't recognize you. Are you from uh, the rescue mission? Are you from downtown? He said, no, sir, I preached for you five years ago. And this man, John Clifford, you couldn't recognize him. His face was worn out from drinking and sin and immorality, and he had been in the rescue mission. And he couldn't believe that that was the same man that five years later preached a revival service where the Lord showed up. God put you. It doesn't matter if you're five years old. It doesn't matter if you're 55 years old. You say, well, I don't have what he has, and I don't have what he has, and I could never. You're not supposed to. I could stand up here for an hour and give you my deficiencies, but that's not what God put me in the position to do and to accomplish in his work that's going to last for eternity and have something to give glory, however that works, credit card or however that works, back to God. What are you going to have to give back to God? Amen. All right.